What's coming next in military technology, organization, operations, and culture? Well, no one is better equipped to answer those questions than our own panel of experts that we have assembled for you this weekend, beginning with Ron Granieri, my colleague and very good friend. Granieri is the Executive Director of FPRI Center for the Study of America and the West. He is the host of FPRI's Geopolitics with Granieri, a monthly series of discussions with distinguished visitors. He is um, a specialist in international history, trained at Harvard as an undergrad and at the University of Chicago for his PhD, and is a renowned scholar on both sides of the Atlantic. Ron has taught at Furman at Penn, where, by the way, he won just about every teaching award offered by those institutions, as well as at Temple, Syracuse, and the University of Tübingen in Germany. He's the author of The Ambivalent Alliance, Conrad Adenauer in the West, 1949 to 66. He's working on the fall and rise of German Christian democracy from detente to reunification, and he is consultant for the Office of the Historian in the Department of Defense. Please welcome Ron Granieri. Thank you so much, Walter, <clears throat> and thank you, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. I appreciate the chance to visit the first Division Museum for the uh, for the first time in my life. I'm as excited as uh, as anybody else could be to uh, to see the place and to see all of you. This is my second. FPRI History Institute, but the first one where I actually was given the uh, opportunity to give a talk, so I hope you will bear with me as I try to figure out how to, uh, how to impress such an impressive audience. I want to start with, uh, there's an old joke that English uh, speeches begin with a joke and German speeches start with an apology, and so I'm going to start with, uh, with, a, with an amusing apology, and that is I do not have a PowerPoint presentation for today. I say that, um, and I, I was trying to gauge the reaction of the audience. The first time I gave a talk to a, uh, a, an audience at the Pentagon when I said I didn't have a PowerPoint, I heard a colonel sitting in the front row murmur to his aide next to him, thank God. Um, but um, I don't know how you all feel about, uh, about PowerPoint, but we will, we'll talk about that later. But my, my job here today is to provide a historical background uh, a historical context for much of what we're going to discuss for the rest of the uh, day and a half that we're together. Uh, it's a big title. Big titles are fun because you can get a lot of things underneath them. From the Cold War to post 9-11 in historical perspective. I'm not going to talk about the entire history of that period, but I'm going to bring up uh, a, a few things that I hope will uh, provoke uh, and get some conversation going and will also set the stage for what you'll hear from the experts who are going to follow. Uh, there will be some overlap, um, and it will be, I'm sure it will be interesting to compare the, the things that I say now to what you might hear later on, and I hope that will also stir some conversation. So I want to start with an, with an observation, and that is that the history of American military policy, the connection between the American military and American political life, is a history of approach and avoidance. Although some commentators enjoy suggesting that there is a deep warrior culture in American life, the truth is democratic societies have an uneasy relationship with military establishments. That the ideological and historical roots of American democracy are deeply embedded in Anglo-Saxon suspicion of standing armies and all they suggest about permanent state power. So it's not surprising that for much of its history, the United States of America has had a relatively weak national military establishment. Outside of limited engagements on the frontier and the vast but brief spasm of violence of the Civil War, Americans on the whole have shown for most of their history an aversion to the creation and maintenance of a large military establishment. Even as American mythology celebrates the heroism of the individual, that celebration of individual warrior virtue did not develop into a military culture that celebrates the military as an institution. One could say that the United States has a, a hero culture, a reverence for the individual doer of deeds in uniform or not from Sergeant York to John Rambo. But that's not the same thing as the kind of military culture or militarism that people can see in, say, European societies or in the society of, say, uh, uh, of, of Imperial Japan 
This is an opening consideration to help us realize that the decades since the middle of the 20th century, during which the United States emerged as the foremost military power on the planet, are actually something of a historical anomaly. Granted, thanks to political and practical inertia, at least we may expect that anomaly to extend well into the current century. But even as it does, Americans continue to wrestle with their approach and avoidance of the existence of and the use of a large military establishment. As the United States wrestles with the ambivalence of a superpower that doesn't like to share its power, but is also uncertain about how best to use it. Now, Walter started us off just now talking about how the, the if we think of the Vietnam War as a great turning point, uh, or this watershed from the pre-modern to the modern American military state, uh, a big part of this, of course, is that by the end of the Vietnam War, January 1973, when uh, at the same time that the United States was concluding the uh, active military engagement with the Paris Accords, the United States was also taking a big step away from the Vietnam era military with the emergence of the all-volunteer force. And creating a, an all-volunteer force, which was designed in part uh, to, uh, to avoid the future social and political difficulties that emerged from using the draft at a time of war. And indeed, Richard Nixon's first uh, Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, uh, announced in 1969 to all who would listen, although Melvin Laird is not terribly famous combined with the other members of the Nixon administration, but Laird made clear when he came into office that he had two goals as Secretary of Defense. So he wanted to end the war in Vietnam and he wanted to end the draft. And he actually accomplished both of those things. Now the emergence of an all-volunteer force coincided with a period of both real and imagined American retrenchment after 1973. When we think about the American military establishment from <clears throat> the early 70s into the 1980s, uh, it is a period of relative decline in budgets, relative decline in investment in technology. Um, some critics talked about this, the emergence of the dangers of the hollow force, um, that you had a, a military force that was not, not keeping up to date. Um, and this would lead to uh, a political backlash in the 1980s, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But when we think about the problem of the United States as a superpower from the 1970s onward, where's always that question of how strong should the United States be in order to live up to its responsibilities? How important were, was the military establishment to playing the global role that Americans thought they were going to play? There's lots of discussion in the 1970s about strategic sufficiency versus strategic superiority. Um, is it possible for the, that the pursuit of detente, for example, with the Soviet Union was a way to reduce the necessity of, of uh, American military power? But we'll talk about a lot of those issues uh, in the uh, rest of the time we have before us and in the question and answer. But it is, because we have this problem of the, the existence of, military, of, of a military establishment and then what you do with it. It's one thing to want to be strong and to be perceived to be strong. It is another thing altogether to want to put that strength to the test. I want to give you two brief historical examples. One, an older one taken from my, my uh, University of Chicago days as a scholar of, of, of German history and one more contemporary. In the 18th century, Frederick William of Prussia was known as the soldier king. He is responsible for creating the Prussian army of legend. Right. He even he made sure to he designed the uniforms. He helped. To, he supervised the uh, the the, uh, the development of very detailed drill. He even ordered the creation of a special military unit, the Potsdam Guards, who were who were selected for their height so that they could impress anybody who came to the Prussian uh, to the Prussian uh, capital, so that they could see the power of the Prussian state. Uh, he was called the Soldier King, and indeed in his life he so bound up Prussia's identity with its military that the joke in the 18th century was other kingdoms have armies, Prussia is an army that has a kingdom. But in his entire reign, the soldier king fought zero wars. And indeed, this was part of his idea. He certainly never wanted to start one. There were moments when it looked like Prussia might get involved in conflict, but he tried to avoid it, in part because he worried about the danger that war would pose to this beautiful instrument he had created, but he also realized there was a, that as long as Prussia appeared strong, Prussia could achieve many of its political goals without the risk. He, of course, has succeeded, Frederick William is, by his son, Frederick the Great, 
Frederick the Great, who from the very moment that he becomes king, starts a war. Because he couldn't imagine why you'd have this spectacular army and not use it. And Frederick, spent, Frederick was on the throne for 46 years, and for most of those 46 years, Prussia was at war. So much so that by the 1760s, Prussia was on the verge of bankruptcy. It was only the collapse of an alliance against Prussia that saved Prussia from destruction. Now, Frederick the Great has this wonderful historical reputation as a result of his military exploits, but whether it was so good for Prussia is another question entirely. Um, it is also worth noting that 20 years after he died, when Prussia faced a military situation, many of its leaders decided that Prussia had to show that it was strong to live up not to the image of Frederick William, the soldier king, but the image of Frederick the Great, and they decided to go to war against France in 1806. And for their trouble, the Prussians got crushed, destroyed, and occupied. It's a question of, you can, it's nice to have an army, it's nice to be strong. It is very difficult um, to maintain that strength if you insist on using it up. One could argue, right, that the best possibility is to be thought strong and strong enough that you don't have to be tested. Let's consider a more recent historical example. Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980, famously in part, promising to restore American military power after an alleged decade of neglect in the 1970s. And his Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger, was tasked with, the, with managing the greatest military buildup in American history to that time. Uh, more than a trillion extra dollars were spent on the military budget in the Reagan administration um, in less than eight years, developing a host of military technologies that are still the backbone of American global power. Both Reagan and Weinberger, however, remained ambivalent about the uses to which American power should be put. Defense increases may have been necessary to close the window of vulnerability they saw threatening during the 1970s and to restore a strong deterrence posture vis-a-vis -vis Soviets. Weinberger's Pentagon even ramped up its cooperation with the entertainment industry to provide key support for the military, um, offering uh, unprecedented support for such indirect recruiting films as Top Gun in 1986, um, which helped to contribute to the American cult of the maverick hero involved in episodes of Daring Do that had little impact on world affairs. But despite the huge buildup, Despite the willingness to talk about it, despite the willingness to show it off, contrary to the alarmist diatribes of their critics, neither Reagan nor Weinberger was especially enthusiastic about using that military power. During the entire Reagan administration, the American military was put to use two and a half times to overthrow the government of Grenada, to send uh, peacekeeping forces to Lebanon, and to launch a, an airstrike against Libya in April of 1986 difference between having a military and using it. And Weinberger himself in 1984, November 1984, in a famous speech at the National Press Club, spoke, spoke out against the excessive use of military force in developing his so-called Weinberger Doctrine. At that time, considering the negative experiences of the American peacekeeping force in Lebanon, Weinberger staked out a position that military force should be only as a last resort um, and only if the United States could be assured of both massive superiority and complete support at home. This actually put Weinberger at odds with his most prominent rival within Reagan's cabinet, Secretary of State George Shultz, who argued in favor several times for the sending of American military units to different parts of the world. It is interesting in uh, in, in much of the history of the Reagan administration, George Shultz is praised as the great peacemaker, the peacekeeper, the dove who negotiated with the Soviets, whereas Weinberger is the terrible militarist who, built, who spent all this money on the military. But in 1984, Weinberger rejects any plans for the use of military force to, uh, to as he saw it, to spread a brigade here and a brigade there in the service of this or that military goal. He believed that all military actions the United States should perform should be subjected to six basic questions. Is a vital national interest at stake? Will we commit enough forces to win? Do we have clearly defined political and military objectives? Will we reassess and adjust our forces as necessary? Will Congress and the American people support the action? And is the use of force our last resort? 
Weinberger believed the United States needed to be strong enough to deter adversaries and to fight when necessary, but that didn't mean he was a militarist, much to the frustration of hawkish colleagues. Um, in his memoirs, George Shultz has one sentence on this entire subject. He says, quote, Cap Weinberger and the Pentagon were extremely wary and reluctant to use the formidable capabilities lodged in the Department of Defense. You can almost hear the Secretary of State sighing with frustration as he writes that. And Weinberger's legacy lived on in his former senior military assistant, General Colin Powell, who as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff developed what he called the Powell Doctrine, which he would say in interviews was a variation of the Weinberger Doctrine, um, where he drew on his own experiences and argued that massive force only as a last resort and in pursuit of clear objectives, that these should be the, uh, the motivations for the use of American force. For his trouble, Powell had to contend with his own hawkish civilian colleagues who wanted to use the military for their own purposes. Most famously, UN Ambassador and future Secretary of State Madeleine Albright spoke for many and echoed her predecessor when she expostulated, what's the point of having this superb military you're always talking about if we can't use it? In his memoirs, Powell recalled that he, quote, almost had an aneurysm when she said that. Um, but it is basically this problem, right? To be strong, to have this military power, but to decide what is the best way to use it. What we see in the history of American, uh, in, in the history of American power, especially the American career as a superpower, such as it is, is a, a fascinating tension between civilians and the military, um, but not along the lines that so, uh, simple, uh, uh, simple uh, assumptions would have it. It is not always the military who are the hawks, right? It's not General Jack D. Ripper ranging about the, uh, raging about the need to protect our, our purity of our vital uh, essences against, uh, against sensible civilians. That there actually is, there's a great deal of tension back and forth, and a lot of that tension results from this idea that you build it up, you have it, you are strong. Do you have to use your military strength in order to prove that you are strong? Um, and is it, possible to have a, is it possible to have a serious discussion about the long-term costs and benefits of using military, uh, using military force? And I think we get an interesting perspective, I think, on how, uh, how difficult it is to strike this balance and also the kind of potentially dangerous assumptions that lurk within American politics about the military. If we, if we focus especially on this, the period between 1989 and 2001, um, this was the period during which history allegedly ended, the world order was made new, and the United States could sit back and enjoy the peace dividend by focusing on the economy and leaving the world to take care of itself through the emergence of free trade and globalization. Now, that's a, I'm being hyperbolic there, but it is, it contains an important element of truth because the short 21st century period from 1989 to 2001 had a split personality that highlighted the deep ambivalence in American society toward military action. It is true that defense budgets fell during this period, and the Defense Department itself found itself downgraded in significance in American political circles, especially during the first term of the Clinton administration. But this is not to say that the post-Cold War period was especially peaceful. Indeed, the end of the Cold War, which removed for the first time in a generation the fear that a small conflict could ignite an apocalyptic conflagration, meant that the United States was actually free to pursue military operations to an extent that few could have dreamt of before. Remember, as I said, during the 1980s, we're going to two and a half times. Um, in, the 19, in the decade of peace that followed 1989, however, American armed forces were involved in no less than a half dozen major military operations. From Panama to the Persian Gulf, from Bosnia to Kosovo, to Haiti and Somalia. American forces fought more enemies in more places than at any time since 1945, even before the first armored columns rolled into Baghdad in the spring of 2003. And this was after defeating its existential global rival without firing a shot. It's a tantalizing paradox, at least on the surface. And to unravel that paradox requires an understanding of the primary elements of modern American attitudes towards the military. For our purposes today, I want to focus on three. Um, and these will touch on some of the topics we're going to talk about for the rest of the well, weekend. Um, 
an affection for technology, uh, a concern about costs, both monetary and human, and an uncomfortable relationship with allies. Talked about how each of these things, these three elements combined to shape American military policy after the Cold War to help determine not only why, but how the U.S. chose to use force. Now, let's start with the, the question of technology, which is a, a fascinating one because it's related to this idea by that by reducing the apparent costs of conflict, one makes conflict more possible. And if you make it more possible and more conceivable, you also, there's also the danger you make it more likely. And an emphasis on technology has deep roots in American military thinking. It's a product of America's can-do spirit. Um, it also serves to reinforce the desire to believe that victory can come at the lowest possible blood price. Even during the Cold War, um, such attitudes were prevalent in the belief that air power, for example, Professor McDougall mentioned to you the, the millions of tons of bombs that were dropped on South Vietnam, that air power alone could, um, could solve problems, or could at least um, when either it could, it could bring the other side to the bargaining table. In planning for possible conflict in Central Europe during the Cold War, there was always the hope that American air power could somehow balance out the Soviet advantage in manpower. Um, after, 1980, after, after 1989, and certainly in the Clinton administration, there was an even greater emphasis that technology would make possible the reduction of the defense budget while also um, pr promising that the American military would remain, in the words of President Clinton, the best equipped, the best trained, and the best prepared fighting force on the face of the earth. Even as they hoped to use the savings um, that came from emphasis on technology to do other things. Now the emphasis on technology connects to an increasing American distaste for casualties, which is you know, perfectly natural human uh, impulse. Um, it's, a, it's also a reaction, one, some many argue, to the, uh, the democratic impulse to avoid actions that would imperil too many real or potential constituents. American strategy um, after, uh, after the end of the Cold War um, tried to uh, avoid major ground commitments. We'll talk about the Persian Gulf War in a moment. Um, now in a nuclear age, a reliance on long-range munitions was tempered by fear of nuclear retaliation, but by the 1990s, the emergence of precision-guided conventional weapons offered potential liberation from those fears. They also count, uh, provided countless opportunities for American presidents to show firmness at a cost of no more than a million dollars a missile, um, such as at the times President Bush and Clinton used Tomahawk cruise missiles, for example, to send messages to Saddam Hussein or to Al-Qaeda. Um, <clears throat> it is interesting because this fits in also with the desire to move to the all-volunteer force or with the consequences, the sort of unintended consequences of the all-volunteer force, right? As the, the military as a segment of American society gets smaller and smaller. Um, as we've, we will talk about this as well, right? This fewer and fewer people in American society have direct experience with the military. Um, and the, there is, a, there is a, a phenomenon where the actual soldier, the actual soldier, sailor, airman, becomes a smaller and smaller part of political calculation. An emphasis on technology makes that even easier because it makes it seem as though you can focus on watching the TV screen, watching the, uh, the missile hitting its target, and you don't necessarily have to worry about the people who are firing those missiles. A focus on technology appears to offer a war without soldiers and a war without social consequences. But it can also mean that decisions for war are made by leaders who have never had any actual experience in military life and one in which they may certainly underplay the significance of that technology or the, the damage that technology re wreaks on the places where it, against which it is directed. Now, reliance on technology and a desire to control the peril in which American soldiers could be placed feeds into the third key characteristic of American military policy um, in the post-Cold War world and down to the present. That is a desire to avoid being tied down by one's friends. Even though it is always nice to have someone with whom to split the check or share responsibility for a particular action, the United States has always had a problem with allies. In a further reflection, perhaps, of individual hero culture, American leaders have preferred to think of themselves as acting alone even when they have friends. From Woodrow Wilson's desire for the USA to be an associated rather than allied power in the First World War, to the reluctance to share command of American troops in multinational forces that persists to the present day. 
Americans have generally preferred sidekicks to partners, thinking of themselves less as the three musketeers, who after all are a French creation, um, and more as Superman, or maybe Batman, with the United Kingdom playing the role of Robin. When it comes to alliances, even when they are working well, the United States remains tendentially Marxist of the Groucho variety. The United States doesn't like to accept any members who want too much to be part of their club. Thus, the 1990s, the period of American hyperpower, were also the decade of the resentful titan, a United States that enjoyed unparalleled military dominance, but which could never figure out what to do with that dominance and got irritated when its friends kept coming up with suggestions. Did the United States aspire to lead the new world order or hope to be left alone? Keeping these three qualities in mind helps us to understand the nature of American military action after the end of the Cold War. In many ways, the first Gulf War was an anomaly, much more related to the Cold War military and diplomacy than, that had come before than to the era that would follow. The laborious organization of the coalition that ejected Saddam Hussein from Kuwait was a triumph of politics and strategy and a showcase for the military hardware developed during the Reagan buildup, from the Patriot missile in the Abrams tank to the Humvee. At the same time, however, it was a triumph that took too long to develop and which was not to be repeated. From that point on, a United States unfettered by Cold War worries sought military engagements that could be organized individually and reliant on technology with as few American boots on the ground as possible and as little conversation with either the public or allies about long-term strategy. The turning point here was Operation Just Cause, the decision to send troops to Somalia, a parting Christmas gift from the outgoing Bush administration to the new Clinton administration. Initially conceived of as a short-term emergency humanitarian response, Bill Clinton celebrated this use of American power when he greeted soldiers returning from Somalia in May 1983 by saying, you have proved again that our involvement in multilateral efforts need not be open-ended or ill-defined, that we can go abroad and accomplish some distinct objectives and then come home again when the mission is accomplished. But that hopeful vision faded pretty quickly. What began as a humanitarian mission crept into a broader commitment to alter the politics of Somalia without much public or even internal discussion on the subject and eventually drew American forces into a conflict that they could not win, culminating in the Battle of Mogadishu in early October 1993. Those violent hours, immortalized in the book and film Black Hawk Down, saw American rangers facing fierce fire in the midst of a chaotic urban hellscape with numerous dead and wounded, and the bodies of at least two American servicemen dragged through the streets. American society had little stomach for casualties beforehand. They had even less afterwards. The Somali experience sapped whatever enthusiasm Americans may have had for long-term humanitarian operations and contributed to, the making, to making nation building a dirty word. Those lessons sank in as the new administration formulated its subsequent approach to the world. The Clinton years provide a uh, Clinton and his team entered office determined to downplay foreign and military policy in their campaign. You remember their most important slogan was, it's the economy, stupid. Um, and of course, the image of the, you know, perhaps the, mo the, most successful, the most successful world statesman we've had as President of the United States. I'll say this because it's being recorded. Um, George, w George H. W. Bush, right, the man who managed the end of the Cold War, helped to build up the, the uh, coalition that, um, that defeated Saddam Hussein in Kuwait, um, who uh, managed to even, re even restart discussions about the future of the Middle East, um, a man who had gone a long way towards essentially wrapping up the Cold War, lost the presidency in part because he didn't seem to appreciate a supermarket scanner. What that says about American society is something we could talk about perhaps in the question and answer session. But President Clinton comes in uh, determined to downplay world affairs. Actually, and this is in some ways, this is a very cynical argument for a guy who was himself a, a Rhodes Scholar who had lived and traveled abroad, right? He knew foreign affairs was important, but he also knew what would win elections. It's also interesting that in his construction of his cabinet, right, he tended to downplay uh, military policy in particular. His first choice for Secretary of Defense, uh, Congressman Les Aspen, was known as a, uh, a a critic of the, from the House of, uh, Armed Services Committee, but was not a terribly good manager and actually would end up leaving the, uh, 
leaving the Pentagon by the end of 1983, thanks in part to what happened in Somalia. And when Aspen left, he's replaced by William Perry, who was a uh, basically a, a career military manager whose job it was to keep military questions as far from the president's desk as possible. <clears throat> In Clinton's first year in office, remember as well that um, the, the most important piece of military policy that he dealt with was the question of don't ask, don't tell. Which, another thing that is fascinating, you talk about how history changes in, in, in just a couple of decades, is to remember how don't ask, don't tell in 1983 was considered an important symbolic breakthrough for tolerance and progressive policy. Um, 20 years later, don't ask, don't tell was treated as an, an antiquated relic <clears throat> of, an older, uh, of an older period of intolerance. It's a fascinating question. But Clinton wrestled with this problem of, you know, that as of, uh, in part because of his personal history, um, in part because of the people in his inner circle, that he was, un he was unsympathetic to military matters. Um, it's worth noting that during the Clinton years, Caspar Weinberger, um, out of office, um, co-wrote a book with uh, Peter Schweitzer of the, of the uh, Hoover Institution, um, in which they criticized the Clinton administration for allowing the American military to wither. Um, and in this book called The Next War, Weinberger and Schweitzer laid out six different scenarios for possible wars. Um, the, the book is a fascinating sort of combination of sort of military fantasy and political polemic, um, which basically every single, every single uh, scenario that they develop, whether it's a war with, with Russia, with China, with North Korea, with Japan, yes, with Mexico, yes, um, that every one of them ends up with, boy, it would be, it, it, uh, we can avoid all of these wars if only we will build more stuff. Um, it's a fascinating debate in the 1990s. But for his part, Bill Clinton wanted to keep the United States active in the world um, without making excessive commitments and without engaging in very detailed discussions about it either. Um, and this, these shaped American military action elsewhere in the world. When fighting broke out in the former Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, Right, the initial American impulse was to say, well, Cold War's over, this is for the Europeans to handle, um, which, both, which served both the purpose of avoiding American responsibility, but also sounded like a good way to deal with the post-Cold War world. Now, the Europeans, of course, failed utterly to deal with the problem of post-war, of, 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 of post-Cold War Yugoslavia, which is a story all its own, which we can do perhaps at another time. Um, but when, when the chips were down, right, the United States did provide air power to intimidate the Serbs and force a peace settlement on Bosnia, and even hosted the peace negotiations in Dayton, Ohio. Nevertheless, the United States showed little interest in participating in long-term ground operations or in the peacekeeping that followed. When war flared again in the former Yugoslavia in 1999 over the plight of Kosovo, the United States again offered technology and air power. <clears throat> but President Clinton made clear from the beginning that there would be no American boots on the ground even when it appeared that the Serbs were trying to hold out, and when it's clear that the Europeans would not be willing or able to put boots on the ground. Um, this is an announcement that threatened to undercut the NATO allies and almost encouraged the Serbs to hold out, although eventually the Serbs did come to the peace table. Even on that limited basis, where the United States emphasized the use of air power, um, the United States expressed frustration with the cumbersome mechanism of consensus building within the NATO alliance. NATO Supreme Commander Wesley Clark complained many times about how hard it was to make decisions in an alliance of 19 members, especially because, remember, the, the war in Kosovo begins at the same time as NATO was formally expanding and admitting new members, and, of course, on its 50th anniversary, it was the first time the NATO alliance took a military action as an alliance. It was actually an alliance that was constructed to defend Western Europe against, a, uh, against the Soviet threat. The first time it actually was operationalized was in this war in Kosovo. <clears throat> but the, the experience in Kosovo was, was intensely frustrating for all sides. Um, it fed the prejudices of some who, uh, of Europeans who felt like the Americans didn't want to share decision making, but it also fed the frustrations of Americans who felt like they were providing all of the hardware and all of the know-how, and they were expected to share uh, decision making with Europeans who were not pulling their weight. <clears throat> At best, both Americans and Europeans were willing to entertain a division of labor in which the Americans cooked the meal and the Europeans do the dishes, to use a phrase from the 1990s, to deal with the, the peacekeeping and what comes after. But neither side truly respected either the inclinations or the abilities of the other. Now, the experience of the Clinton years shaped the 2000 presidential campaign. 
and provided context for George W. Bush's rejection of nation building and his promise of a humble foreign policy. For Bush, it appeared that <clears throat> Clinton's actions had been, had been to expect too much from a nation that preferred to pull back from the world, wanted to cut taxes, and enjoy the benefits of a world order it had helped to create. The first nine months of the Bush administration reflected the president's priorities, as he spent more time discussing tax cuts and stem cell research than he did on international affairs. Culminating, of course, in the famous 6 August 2001 presidential daily briefing, where he was told, while, on, while at his ranch, that bin Laden was determined to attack the United States. Um, and, well, we know what happened afterwards. But George Bush's priorities in the summer of 2001 reflected those of the American people. At the same time, however, the Pentagon, under Donald Rumsfeld, Bush's Secretary of Defense, was in the midst of a significant retooling that's also worth uh, discussing for a moment. Now, Donald Rumsfeld is, uh, whatever you might think of him, Donald Rumsfeld is a fascinating character. He is, he's the answer to um, the kind of historical trivia question that makes historians so beloved by their non-historian relatives, and that is Donald Rumsfeld is the, both the oldest and the youngest man ever to be Secretary of Defense. Um, so he and Jerry Brown, the oldest and youngest man to be Governor of California, um, actually, are answers to a similar uh, trivia question. But when, when Rumsfeld came in in 2001, he wanted to bring new managerial drive to the Pentagon. He was not interested in, in presiding necessarily over a buildup of the Weinberger proportions, but instead he wanted to implement a series of doctrinal and practical changes known collectively, as Professor McDougall mentioned, as the revolution in military affairs. Broadly stated, the RMA emphasized technology over manpower, surgical strikes over massive footprints, and speed above all. The brainchild, in part, of a, uh, of a tight society of scholars around um, the, Pen the Pentagon's legendary director of the Office of Net Assessment, Andrew Marshall, the most important American defense person that nobody in this room has ever heard of. Well, maybe not nobody, but hardly anybody's ever heard of. The RMA was the ideal distillation of American preferences for military action um, that could be precise, technological, and unilateral. And Rumsfeld's blizzard of snowflakes, the memos that he was famous for sharing with his staff, aimed to shift Pentagon priorities in that direction. Now, the RMA aimed to make the use of force more efficient and less costly. The danger, of course, was that it could also make the use of force easier, whether that was the ultimate intention of the administration or not. Um, some military scholars like Andrew Basevich, for example, have pointed out that the, the, uh, the revolution in military affairs went a long way to um, perpetuate the idea that force could be exercised from sort of centrally, uh, centrally administered at a long distance with as little cost as possible. Um, it was the alluring belief that sufficient diligence could bring the perfect weapon into reach and once realized that weapon was sure to make short work of all sorts of nagging difficulties. Now this is important to keep in mind. The RMA, as well as sort of an American desire to avoid intense, uh, intense uh, uh, conflicts with the rest of the world, when we try to appreciate the response to 9-11, because the RMA actually provided the blueprint for American response to 9-11, for better or for worse. Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan was the appetizer, a successful operation that required virtually no American land forces outside of a few special operations teams to overthrow the Taliban. That operation, that the operation failed to capture those directly responsible for 9-11 um, is another question. But uh, that also then feeds into Operation Iraqi Freedom, which was organized by the Pentagon to achieve maximum military success with a minimum of soldiers. Um, and within which, we think about this, right, that the, the first Gulf War required about half a million soldiers um, just to eject the uh, Iraqis from Kuwait. Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003 required a third that many to overthrow the government in Baghdad. Um, but this is, uh, the, the result, of course, afterwards is, is when you have fewer soldiers, right? It depends on what you're trying to do with that military force. If you're trying to win a battle and to show that you can win a battle with fewer soldiers, you can do that. Whether you can actually occupy or pacify a territory afterwards is another matter entirely. Um, and this is, this is where we get into those, the American emphasis on technology, a desire to limit costs, um, and an ambivalence about how we deal with allies. The attacks of 9-11, 
um, also have an interesting reflection on that relationship to allies. As, as many of you know, um, after the 9-11 attacks, the NATO alliance formally convened to invoke Article 5, the Article on Self-Defense, which was essentially the, the allies did do what they were supposed to do. They said that an attack on any one of us is an attack on all of us, and that the alliance should, as a whole, respond. But the response from the Bush administration in Washington, while they were pleased that the, the allies had said this, the response from the administration was, you guys just wait a minute, we've got this. Right? That the plans for Afghanistan, the plans for Iraq, were not organized through the NATO alliance. They were organized through Washington alone. And the idea was that this would make things more smooth and streamlined than they had been in Kosovo. Um, Washington was, of course, happy to invite NATO to come help and do the dishes in Afghanistan and wanted some of them to help do the dishes in Iraq, but the difficulty of organizing the conflict, uh, that was something that they wanted to save for themselves. Now, I've, as I say, I've tried to be a little provocative, and I wanted to be a little provocative today to get us thinking about this. So I want to end with a couple of, of thoughts about, you know, because the problem of, you know, if superpowers don't do dishes, or build nations, or guard national museums. Um, what, are, what are the responsibilities of the military in a superpower, and what are the responsibilities of political leaders to the military in deciding how it should be used, how it should be developed, how it should be organized? Right, that the, 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 to the, the immediate aftermath of 9-11, you had successful military operations that then created enormous political and strategic problems that we are still wrestling with. Um, this is not the military's fault, right? right. This, is, this is largely the fault of the civilians who are responsible for managing it and running it. And this is where we get to the problem of how do we talk about the purposes of military force? Um, is it just to, to satisfy a desire, to send a message? Um, even if we, if we don't do pinpricks, Right, what do we do um, as a society? What do we do with our military? Um, the victories of 2002, 2003, and the defeats in the decades that, the decade that followed are intimately bound up with a strategic and military culture in the United States, in political life, that has preferred to avoid discussing hard choices, hoping that technology would create solutions before politically embarrassing discussions were necessary. When it has not, the military has been forced to go back to the drawing board. I mean, one of the fascinating things about the war in Iraq that is both fascinating and sad is that the, the military had to go back and relearn discussions about counterinsurgency and work, winning hearts and minds that many in the military thought that they had learned 30 years before. The continuing disconnect in American society, I think there still is, continuing disconnect between what American society and its leaders want to be able to do militarily and what they are willing to sacrifice to do it remains very worrisome. The current administration, for example, appeals to a war-weary public and promises an end to the decade of war. And it has begun shrinking the defense budget, while also discussing the possibility of military action in Libya, in Syria, in the Ukraine, and by talking about a pivot to Asia to match rising Chinese power. Somehow to do all these things and to shrink the budget without actually talking about how, the, how they link to each other. Whether the deeds or plans match their actions is a major question mark. And the questions of what should the United States do, how, how is the United States going to do it, what kinds of choices have to be made, these are questions, they are, they are nonpartisan questions that will persist no matter who wins the presidency in the next election. So much has happened since the end of the Cold War, though it's not clear that any particular lessons have been learned about matching means and ends. The old adage says that if the only tool you have is a hammer, pretty soon every problem looks like a nail. Um, the converse, of course, is that if you don't have a hammer, you tend to ignore nails, even when they're sticking out. The most sensible approach, of course, is not only to have a variety of tools at your disposal, but also to know how and when it's best to use them. Military power is a very important tool. And when used appropriately, it can be vital to the preservation of peace and stability and to the national interest. But it can only serve that interest and that purpose if both the leaders and the general public realize that they cannot treat military power as something that's only left to the experts or something that's can only, that can be used for symbolic purposes and be turned on and off like a switch. 
we all, the public, leaders, people who are going to be teaching the, the, the future leaders, have to learn how military power is best used and to discuss its development uh, and its purpose. This, of course, is one of the motivations behind this weekend's institute. Um, we want to encourage all of you as educators to learn more about uh, the use of American power, the development of American power, the meaning of American power, uh, uh, and the role of the military in the contemporary United States, and to find ways to share what you learn with your students. And so we look forward to those kinds of conversations. The United States entered the post-Cold War era aware of its power, certainly. Um, and possessed of a hopefulness bordering on hubris that it could use that power to shape the world according to its wishes. Liberated from the fear of global war, American leaders speculated on the possibilities of using American power in therapeutic doses. Apparent success inhibited serious conversations about longer-term strategy. Manifest failure hasn't done much good in that direction either. It's possible, it's possible, that a reluctance to have serious discussions about the means, ends, and limits of military power is endemic to a society that prefers to think it can accomplish everything it wants at minimal sacrifice. We can hope, however, that a mature assessment of recent history will encourage deeper conversation and a willingness to be more realistic about what the future might bring. Hope, after all, is about the most American trait of all. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ron. We'll take uh, questions for the next 15 minutes. Uh, as Paul said, just uh, uh, verticalize your 10 cards and we'll get to your question. I see a vertical 10 card. There is a vertical 10 card over there in the corner. <laughs> Can you state your name and your school? Uh, my name is Gary Morris. Uh, the school that I teach at is McLean County High School in K Calhoun, Kentucky. I actually have two questions. First, do you think that the fact that we've become an all-volunteer force is a reason why there is a major disconnect between the American public and its military? And the other thing that I want to ask about is, is the fact that in an era where we are really the only superpower um, is there a point where at times we need to be thought of as strong and use that to influence and there are times where we need to use that force then to get things done. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see sometimes where the United States has issues with both of those. Mm -hmm. we, we at times refuse to use the fact that we are a strong country to come in and do what should be done correctly. And there are times where we refuse to portray that idea of being strong so that we don't have to use the force. Yeah. I think those are, those, are two, those are two excellent questions. And the first one, I do think that the all-volunteer force, in a, in a paradoxical way, um, and, and certainly in an unintended way, does potentially limit the, uh, or you know, reduce the connection between American society and the American military. I mean, we can look at the numbers and we can see that while, while the military has generally not had any problem reaching its targets for recruiting, it's drawing from a, uh, an increasingly narrow slice of American society. I was at a, a, a recent conference where a, a scholar pointed out that one of, the, one of the strongest determinants for why someone volunteers for the armed forces um, one of them is whether you have a family member who's already in the armed forces. And another one is whether you live in an area near a large active military base. Um, and you put those two together and you begin to see that this is, uh, you know, certainly it's in a free society, it's great that you're defended by people who are voluntarily making that choice. But if there's a feeling that nobody else has to worry about making those choices at all, this is potentially dangerous. And it's hard to know where to go from there. It's, it's worth noting that, say, when, you know, of course, the Carter administration uh, reestablished uh, draft registration in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the crises of the late 70s, 
when the Reagan administration came into power, they actually had a, a, a full-scale debate within the cabinet over the future of the all-volunteer force. There were some who were wondering whether they needed to go, we needed to go back to full, uh, some kind of full-scale universal military service. There were also those who said we shouldn't even register people, that even that was a violation of freedom. It's, it's you know, the way that we have gotten around this problem is in part through the, the emergence of an enormous sort of military advertising complex. Right? And we've done an amazing job in this country finding ways to encourage people to sign up. Um, and, and so in, in, in some ways, right, and of course, think about the way that when you emphasize things like an army of one or be all you can be, right, these are ways to get people to sign up, but they tend, you know, the, the, even military recruiting has always had a hard time between wanting to appeal to the individual and wanting to encourage people to feel like they're part of a team, let alone a team that's defending society. And so there is a, there is a, a long-term problem, and, and it is an, ir an irony that in some ways, right, the all-volunteer force is a, is a modern creation, but we are, we, there is always the risk that you create then an isolated military caste, right, of people who are generation of, generations of soldiers. It's a great service, it's a very important thing, somebody should do it, um, but it, uh, if you, there, if it becomes too separate, where does this go? And ironically, right, this is where technology sort of plays a very ambivalent role in here too, because in some ways, right, technology is good because it means we have many fewer casualties than we would have had with the kind of military operations that we do now. But it's, it, it, that also can encourage those people who are not involved in the military to believe that there are no costs at all, or there are no human costs at all, because they don't see them in their, in their own lives and they, and they imagine um, that it's, it's happening to somebody else. Well, I'm just wondering, you're mentioning that, and, and is it at times, though, we forget the idea that in war, you can't win it by strictly fighting it from afar. No. You actually have to put feet on the ground. There yeah. has to be a risk involved. I have and to. I think sometimes, as a nation, we put aside that idea that we, we've become risk averse. Yes. Uh, yes, we do. We're, we're unwilling to um, realize <laughs> that war doesn't come without casualties. It's going to happen. And it's a part of, of what we have to accept when we get involved in these situations. But we can't get to a point as a society where we refuse to get involved at all. That because is, I think that becomes an even bigger problem. Indeed, and that fits into your, into your second question, right? The issue that ultimately, even a superpower <clears throat> has to make choices and has to be honest about choices that are being made. And so that means if you're going to argue in favor of a particular action, you have to be honest about what it's going to cost and what it's going to bring. And if you're opposed to it, you need to be honest about why you're opposed to it. Um, and that, those kinds of discussions are hard to have. I mean, this is one of the, you know, <clears throat> the, the long-term history of the Iraq War will raise some very troubling questions about um, how honest were the discussions about costs and benefits, what happened to prominent <clears throat> military leaders who worried that 150,000 men was not enough and who worried about this. And <clears throat> this is a, you know, in a way, right, the Cold War in a lot, in, in, on a, on a variety of levels, right? The Cold War provided a framework for understanding world affairs. This is not just true for the United States. I would argue this is true for the European Union as well, right? As long as there was a Cold War and Europe was divided, the European Union could say, man, we'd love to include those states of Eastern Europe. But, ah, what are you gonna do, right? Then when the Cold War ends and those states of Eastern Europe are knocking on the door and saying, hey, for 40 years you said we were your natural brothers and sisters, now you have to do something about it. Um, but this is, a, this is a problem, is you have to be willing to have a conversation. And having that conversation about choices, about the use of power, about what, about what is worth having, requires politicians who are comfortable discussing military issues. It requires a public that's willing to engage this conversation. Um, it's, uh, you know, it is a sort of top to bottom responsibility in a democratic society. It's the responsibility that democratic societies are supposed to welcome and embrace, right, that we all get to talk about these things. But because they are difficult to talk about, and because things are gonna have costs, and sometimes you're going to say, well, this is important to do, and this is why. And we're not going to be able to do it without it costing anything. <clears throat> and people have to make a choice. We'll, we'll come back to that, but that's, those are some great questions. Thank you. Let's go. Mark uh, Yanaway oh, from uh, Wamogo High School in Litchfield, Connecticut. <clears throat> Thank you. You bet. So, Plauswitz said that war is a matter of will. Yes. And Grenier I, says that, too. 
Huh? So, uh, Granary says that too. Good. <laughs> um, so since 60 years ago, Congress has basically abrogated its responsibility to declare war. Yep. And Congress was the mechanism that the Founding Fathers put in power to ensure that the American people's will was being maintained. I would argue in answer to one of the questions you posed that the purpose of the American military is to do the will of the American people. Uh -huh. The military can't do that if the American people haven't told it what its will is, and Congress is the mechanism to do that. Yeah. So I see yes. the problem, and I'd like your comment and Professor a, McDougall's a, comment a, on yeah. how do we get the will of the American people back into the equation? How do we get the will of the American people back into the equation? An excellent question, right? And, and, and it gets to the fundamental problem. I mean, in a way, this was in part the result of bad habits that developed over the course of the Cold War. And, and oh, might as well, this is partially the, the it's, it's, nuclear weapons are partially to blame for this, right? As we created a system during the Cold War where recognizing that you have barely enough time to call the president, let alone to convene a special session of Congress to declare war if a nuclear strike is on the way. That we create, we, we've created a system where the executive makes these decisions, and the, the legislature has been huffing and puffing to catch up. So that's where we get the, the War Powers Act. You know, it only took them what nine years after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution to come up with the War Powers Act. So there is a problem, and, and it, it, part of it is a part of it is an institutional problem. Um, part of it is a political one. When you think about the the, the problem of the people's representatives, you know, as, as glorious and wonderful as we want them to be is generally speaking, if you are one of the people's representatives and you belong to the same party as the president, you are reluctant to cause the president any trouble. If you are a member of the party opposed, the, the, that is not the, part of the, pre, the, the president's party, um, there is the danger that any criticism will be perceived as partisanship rather than logical discussion. So there is a, there is a, uh, a sort of attitudinal, attitudinal is not the right word, yeah, but there, well, there's a structural problem, but there's also just a sort of an intellectual problem of the way that we imagine the role of, of public discussion in the making of foreign and military policy. Because there is a danger, right? It's when, when, one, when one is advancing a particular military policy and somebody starts raising questions against it, there is a very strong temptation to say, ah, you don't understand how complicated this is, just let me handle it. And this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a problem. I mean, in a way, this is the way the United States tends to deal with its allies. Too, is you know, you kids don't understand, you know, you Germans, you French people, you don't understand what it's like to fight wars. You know, we do. You know, that there, that there has to be a willingness to actually engage in this kind of, of discussion. And I do think that in the long term, right, education is part of the responsibility here, right? We have to make people willing to engage in discussions. And then, you know, that the, the structural problems are, uh, you know, it took, us, it took us a generation plus to create this problem for ourselves. Um, it's going to take us a while to solve this problem, too, if we're ever going to solve it. On the, on the ride over from the airport yesterday, Professor McDougall made the, the observation that in the spring of 1942, um, the Congress made its last three declarations of war in the Second World War against it was Hungary, Romania, and uh, who else did we declare war on? In Bulgaria. Um, and, we, and then we said, you know, that's the last time Congress declared war on anybody. And isn't it great, right, since 1942, we haven't been at war with anybody. Um, and it's, uh, it, is a, it is deeply disturbing. And to, to think about how quaint it is, how quaint it is that in the debates over the NATO treaty, um, there was all this discussion about the proper phrasing of Article 5, right? Because we couldn't say the member states will immediately go to war to defend everybody because that would kind of be, you know, unconstitutional. Um, that was actually important enough to create this great write around in Article 5 that says, you know, member states will, um, will consult and will choose the, through proper channels, blah, 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 will choose the proper action. And so we need to, re, we need to rediscover the, the role of, of, uh, of the legislative in military policy. Unfortunately, the only role, all right, I'm going to say this, the only role that the legislature plays in military policy is making sure that we keep building Abrams tanks even when we don't need them anymore. Um, and that's a problem too, right? Is, you know, the, the, because making, making decisions and making choices uh, requires you know, deciding some stuff we don't need anymore. Let's build something else. Randall Lanning, Mascuda High School in Illinois. 
Yes, sir, you've kind of hit all around this, but I, I wonder, in, you alluded to this in your presentation, but with the all-volunteer force, sir, could you comment on the impact that fewer and fewer of our political leaders have actually served in the military yeah. and what impact that is having on this whole discussion? I, that is that is a that is lurking in the background. I mean, in a way, right? We've had a we've had a bit of a dress rehearsal for this uh, debate, just as when we get to the the post-war generation, where you had military service connected to Vietnam and all of the political complexities that involved, right? The issues of of Bill Clinton's relationship to the military and even George W. Bush's uh, connection. I mean, he, and and of course, the, the the real dress rehearsal for all this was Dan Quayle as vice president in 1988, as the first representative of his generation, to have to answer the question, right, what did you do during the war, Daddy? And um, I, I think that the, the, it's only going to get more intense, right, because now it's not even a question of people avoiding military service because they were able to, uh, uh, to get a deferment. Now it's, you know, it never comes up at all, right? I was born in 1967, so I remember, I was, I remember registering for selective service when I was 18 years old in 1985, and that's the closest I've come to military service. Since that, and when I when I use my cat card to go to my office um, at the office of Secretary of Defense, so that it is it is going to be a longer term problem. And I mean, I think that you know, Paul made a great comment at the very beginning, right? Is that you know all the things that we, especially educators, have a big responsibility here. Right? You don't you don't have to have served in the military to have sensible things to say about military policy. It can help. Sometimes it can hurt. But it, but what you have to have is a a willingness to learn about. It. Right, and, and a recognition of how important it is. And so this is going to be a longer term challenge than for American leaders and for an American electorate that chooses those leaders, is how, how willing and able are we going to be to measure the, um, the capabilities of our leaders to make military policy? Um, you know, and as I will say this too, right, is that, that, you know, that much was made of the fact, right, Chuck Hagel is, uh, you know, was the first enlisted man First, the first enlisted man to become Secretary of Defense. We could have a discussion later on about whether, you know, how or why Secretary Hagel's military service is affecting his management of the Pentagon. Right? The guy that I study, Casper Weinberger, is the last, the last Secretary of Defense to have been an officer in the Second World War. Um, you know, and that's because he was a, he was a captain on the I, MacArthur staff. Does that make him a, a better or worse Secretary of Defense? I really don't know. But it is, but it is this longer-term question. Of, even if you're not, even if the military is going to get smaller, and you're going to have an all-volunteer force, um, it's a, it becomes a matter of, of willingness to learn and willingness to understand, because you're not going to be able to assume that there is a there is an automatic understanding or connection because of people's life experience. Good morning, uh, Pat Tuart from Tunsil High School, Virginia. Uh, I have a question considering the domestic budgetary problems we're facing. Uh, growing entitlements, and yes. interest on the debt, uh, and with the recent sequestration, do you sense a pattern of, of American, perhaps neo-isolationism? And if it's not that, what fate does the United States military have in the face of these ever-expanding deficits in terms of you know, budgetary cuts? Well, there are, there are a couple of different aspects of this problem, and they are disturbing. What is the, the problem with the larger federal budget is what, are we gonna, what, are we, what should we spend our money on and what are we going to spend our money on? But we have the problem within the defense budget. What are we spending our money on? Um, if the when 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 the when the Defense Department talked about reducing by a fraction the increase in the pension payments to veterans who were below retirement age, because they realized that entitlements are swallowing up the defense budget too. But to try to do even that resulted in what what can only be described as a hysterical conversation about the betrayal of America's fighting men. So we have a problem. So that, that's a smaller version of, you know, when you talk about cutting Social Security and Medicaid, you end up with a you know, hysterical discussion about pushing grandma over a cliff. But when, you, but when you talk about reducing benefits within the military, you have a hysterical discussion about betraying our, our brave heroes. Um, there is a longer term problem. We're back to the issue of, Politics among grown-ups has to be a ha, political discussions among grown-ups have to be discussions about choices, and choices mean somebody gets something and somebody doesn't. Now, I'm not I'm not here to you know I'm not I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of any government office, and I, I'm not running for office either. But it is a it is a problem, right? Is if there's only so much money to spend, what are we going to spend it on? Um, and for a lot of for for a, for a very long period, right? An American defense policy has been based on the idea that. Deciding to spend more is the easiest decision to make. 
Um, even this was, a, this was a criticism even within, during the Reagan years, there were some critics of Weinberger who were concerned that because there was, because it was clear that this was a priority of the administration, it was clear that the budget was going to go up, that the secretary's office would get wish lists from the services and would say, okay. Um, that there weren't decisions being made there either. Um, but we have this, we, we as a, you know, the United States has to decide, going back to the issue of being a, being a superpower and deciding what that means, being a global power. Recognizing that in a world of relative scarcity, in a world where we have to make decisions, that means that the United States cannot probably expect to be able to cover the entire world in the same way that it may have once before. Now that raises some very uncomfortable questions, not only about what we're going to spend our money on, but about what kind of strategy we're going to pursue. Right? Are we, are, do, do we have any friends or allies that we're willing to rely on, that we're willing to share power with? Are there, are, there, are there rivals that we are willing to tolerate the existence of and contain but not feel like we have to fight? These are also big and difficult decisions about limits and resources and choices. Um, and you know, going back to the famous comment from Henry Kissinger, when he tried to describe his vision for realism was, he said, we should try to rescue choice from circumstance. Right? That rather than allow ourselves to be simply driven along by, by forces beyond our controls, we have to, we have to rescue choice. Right? Kissinger said a lot of things, some good, some bad. But, the, but this one important thing is the idea that, that you, you have to be able to make choices. And you can't simply fall back on the, well, we have to do this. Or either we have to do this or we can't do this. The question is, do we want to do it? Do we think it's important to do? But that means you actually have to go on the record as saying, I want to do this, and that means we won't be able to do that. I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Ron, for Thanks, laying... Everybody.